This week's performance anxiety features guitarist Richard Lloyd. Richard recorded what is widely considered one of the greatest albums ever made with the band Television and their Marquee Moon album. We talk about that album. We talk about working with Matthew Sweet. We talk about his new album coming out. And we also talk about blowing up a Chinese laundromat and why he got punched by Jimi Hendrix. Please enjoy this episode with Richard Lloyd on Performance Anxiety. Well, let me do your station ID or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's uh, this, go this ahead. This is Richard Lloyd. I'm a recording artist associated with the band Television. I have a record coming out on November 2nd, and it's my pleasure to be here with you. Is it true that your earliest experience with a guitar was while you were spending time with your cousins? They had a guitar. And uh, I got a chance to play it, and I loved it. They showed me uh, three chords, um, G, C, and D. And uh, I kept playing them, and they were like wanting to go to sleep. So I went in the bathroom. Next thing I know, they were knocking on the door, and I was inside, and they said, it's the morning. Have you been here all night? (laughs) And I had been, uh, I guess, all night long playing these three chords. Oh, my God. Uh, and so I was hooked there. My stepfather had a ukulele. So I would play that as if it were a guitar. Oh, wow. And I would detune it and tune it more like a guitar. Then I got a guitar when I was about, uh, I didn't get one till I was about 17. Okay. Uh, were you pa- I played drum. Oh, okay. I had a drum kit and I played drums. I took drum lessons. Oh, wow. Three and a half years. It was from a big band drummer. Oh, really? So it was all very interesting. <laughs> I, <laughs> so was there, school. was there a lot of music in your house growing up? Not really. Oh. Surprisingly, uh, I for the first six years, I lived with my grandparents, and then I went to summers with them, and uh, they didn't listen to any music. And my mother... Uh, and stepdad really didn't listen to much music. My stepdad listened to classical music and jazz. Um, the 1812 Overture was his favorite symphony because oh, of the boy. cannons in it. Yeah. At one point. And he would also listen to Dave Brubeck and uh, stuff like that. Oh, gosh. I love Dave Brubeck. Yeah, me too. Of course. <laughs> yeah, it, it, who doesn't? It's a big hit, Take Five. Oh, it's wonderful. It's, that's such a great song. I love that song. I, I grew up listening to that song with my parents. and It's hard to write a song in 5-4. In I, I think <laughs> well, yeah. It's also hard to... many rock, rock acts have songs in 5-4. No, <laughs> it's also hard to write a song that you know has spanned you know, 50, 60 years or more now that everybody that's knows. True. Yeah, like Happy Birthday or the <laughs> the, uh, the Jack in the Box song. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. wonder so, who wrote that. I don't. Oh gosh, I don't know. That see, my big thing is re- I love research. Now you've got me uh, into a hole that I can go down. So, yeah. <laughs> so there was a guy who copyrighted. Uh, you know, after the fact, they finally fought for his rights to Happy Birthday. Okay, now I always heard that was Paul McCartney. Was it, is that not the case, no, or is it somebody else? No, he, Paul, that song was in existence before Paul was born. Yeah, I know, but so, I, I heard he he bought the rights. But that could just be a rumor oh, that was going on. Bought, he might have bought the publishing rights. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, and that could be just a rumor that I heard as a as a <laughs> kid. Uh, my mom was a huge well, Beatles fan, so. Yeah. He's got a tremendous amount of money. <laughs> yeah. So he could, he could probably afford to buy the rights and then, uh, you know, he get, gets the money from it. Yeah. Sees it. Of course, they, who's going to police its use? Yeah, exactly. In uh, private, you know, because everybody sings it over the phone or oh, yeah. birthday party. Yeah, I don't know who's going. The copyright police are going to the TGI Fridays to arrest all the waiters for singing it to you. 
Exactly. So. I don't think so. <laughs> so I, I read a story that when you were, I guess, around 11th grade, you stopped bringing books to school and you brought your guitar instead. Was it? Is that true? I, I, as soon as I got a guitar, yeah, and I decided I was going to be a guitarist and that I was going to be successful, even though I couldn't play the damn thing, <laughs> I brought it to school and I stopped bringing school books to school. Um, and I stopped doing, well, I, prior to that, I had stopped doing homework because <laughs> I had the, this philosophy that homework is basically a crappy teacher telling you to go teach yourself with a book and then they give you tests. And if you pass the tests, then everybody thinks they're a good teacher, which is a load of bull pony. Um, so I refused to do it and I, because I love to take tests anyway. I loved taking all the tests that they would give out for, you know, various things. So I'd say, finally said, uh, I got in trouble for not doing homework and making that stance. Oh, yeah. uh, and I said, well, give me the tests. If I fail the tests, I'll do homework. But, you know, I never failed the tests. <laughs> I would read the entire textbook in the first three weeks. Oh my God! Pretty much by a month, I would have that year uh, taken care of. Oh my gosh! So one math class or physics, I think it was a physics class. Uh, the teacher asked me where my books are, and I said in the case. And he said, "Well, let's open the case." And he knew there wasn't going to be books in it. <laughs> anyway, we opened it. It was a guitar, and I said, "That's the book I'm studying." Oh wow. How did that, that was that was the end of that. Well, I, was, I was gonna say I don't think that probably went, didn't go over very well. No, it didn't. <laughs> well, all right. So I around, did, I, I'm pretty articulate, and I explained myself pretty well. And there's pretty much nothing they could do except kick me out of the school because I, I got passing grades. You know. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, if, there's not much they, c they can do to you if you're if you're uh, academically doing well. Correct. Although I was an what they call they would always say I was an underachiever. Oh yeah, and I heard I didn't that one. Meet my uh, potential, but you know my potential lay in other areas, music and such, and I knew that I would be uh, eventually successful. And and. You were you you become very successful, but around that time, what music were you listening to? Oh God Almighty! Everything under the sun. I mean, I was listening to music continuously, and rock and blues and jazz and classical and uh, everything but country music. I didn't listen to country music much at all, and I didn't listen to. To dance music. I mean, I listened even to disco and whatever the hits were of the day. I liked uh, back then there was a, the AM radio. FM was just coming into its own, but uh, hadn't really bad, you know, hadn't really become the predominant radio. The radio was still uh, AM radio. Okay. So I used to listen to those stations. In New York, we had two, WABC and WMCA, I think. And they used to play all the hits of the day. Oh, yeah, yeah. They had a, I remember there's WCBS FM. And, uh, yeah, FM. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, your, that's true. You be a little younger than I. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I remember... I'm, Growing up, my dad would always throw on the... 620 years old. You, uh, could you repeat that for me? 3,620 years old. Wow. Yeah, I'm not that old yet. I don't think. No. But that... Okay. Methuselah's, so, Methuselah's like, you know, not doesn't catch up to me. <laughs> well, okay. So that... You, you bring up an interesting topic. I, I know that you... You said that you re actually remember being born. That I can? Yes. No, I don't remember the day of my birth. I remember probably before it, I have memories from, I have memories where there were less laws, that there was less constraint. There were um, more degrees of freedom. Okay. 
And, uh, you know, I began meditating when I was, I didn't even know what it was, meditation. But I began sitting and trying to find my way back to that experience. Nowadays, I think it was probably womb memories because you float in the amniotic fluid. So gravity doesn't affect you. You know, you have greater degrees of freedom. Right. But uh, now that I we just read some, you know, scientists claim that any memory before the age of three is uh, constructed or fantasy or fake or based on pictures. Uh, and if that's true, then my whole life is a sham. <laughs> well, I... Which it may be, you know, but I don't think so. Well, you know, being a fan of science... What's your earliest memory? What's your earliest memory? Mine, I was about three years old, and I remember getting punched in the face. Oh, well, that... That's a true memory if you remember getting punched. <laughs> I remember I was playing in my backyard and uh, we lived on a, some, a corner and some other little kid came up. I was I was outside in the backyard by myself and some other little kid came up and we started fighting. For, yeah, he popped me right in the face. And uh, that's the first well, thing I can really remember. I used to wonder why kids were so nasty, why they were, you know, evil, I, why they were bad. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. My conscience, I had a clean, clear conscience. And some kids were already, you know, ruined. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. And I don't, maybe, it, you know, it could be. A, a bad seed. Yeah. The bad seeds. Yeah. Born, born that way. Maybe their mother was like in terrible mood the whole pregnancy or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think, a, yeah, exactly, and I, th- I think a lot, a lot of uh, what happens, like you said, in the womb, will affect how a child develops. So, um, I guess so. Well, speaking of developing, you, as you were growing up, you became a teenager. You had some of the most incredible experiences. That I've, was inevitable. You, <laughs> okay. Try to prevent it, uh, your kid from becoming a teenager. You can't do it. No, that's true. That's true. I've got three teenagers right now, and it's... So I was living in New York and in Greenwich Village. So we were highly... Uh, we thought of ourselves as the apex of civilization. Right. Which I guess, in a way, we were in the 60s. And Greenwich Village was uh, where it was all, quote-unquote, happening. Yeah, yeah, that, and so I got to do a lot of those things, even as a youngster. And for some reason, we could get into bars. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was drinking in bars when I was fourteen. Oh man! The, the drinking the drinking age was eighteen, and, and uh, sometimes they kick you out, but mostly, you know, they weren't that uh, strict. So is that how you started meeting people like uh, Jimi Hendrix, John Lee Hooker, Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones? Is that by by just getting into the, the bars and hanging out? No, no. I had a friend, my best friend, became my best friend because I believed him. Nobody else believed him when he said he knew Jimi Hendrix, and he did. Oh, this is a great story. You have to tell me this story in person because I... I I know who you're talking about, and I've got his one album, and I love it. You do? I do. That's the only record he made. And it's so good. Silver Turner. Yes. Well, anyway, he, he, I found out later from his mother, he had seen Hendrix on TV and freaked out, jumping up and down saying, I know that guy. I got to meet him. He's somewhere. I got to find him. Anyway, I was over at a friend's house and we were waiting for another friend to come over and, uh, bring us something illegal at the time. (laughs) And uh, anyway, Anyway. the phone rang and we thought it was him, but it wasn't. It was uh, my friend Zeke's uh, parents, and so he hung up the phone. And it rang again, and uh, 
he got off the phone. He was really disappointed. No, that isn't the guy. It's this crazy guy named Velbert, and he wants to come over. I told him he could come over. And he claims to know Jimi Hendrix, which is sheer nonsense. <laughs> right. Well, when he came over and I got a look at him, I knew that he knew Hendrix. I just knew it. So wow. they they asked him to prove it, and we went in the kitchen where they had a phone, and uh, he called up the hotel and asked for somebody. It wasn't the name wasn't Hendrix, and uh, anyway, the, he passed the phone around, and I, it came to me, and it rang once, and the, uh, Jimmy picked it up. I could tell it was him because he went like, a, "Hey man, what's happening? Who is this?" <laughs> and I said. Uh, I didn't know, you know, it's Richard, man, you know, your friend. Yes. No. But I said, it's Velvet, and I gave the phone to Velvet. He went over and talked. We went to see Jimmy play that night. Wow. Oh. And then, you know, we followed rock stars around all all the time when we weren't in school. Uh, Did you get to see uh, Jimmy a lot? No, not a lot, but uh, enough. Watching him at the in the very early... Uh, I guess this was in summer of 68. And watching him was like looking at a nuclear reactor. Oh, I bet. It was like unbelievable. And people would be freaking out in front of him. I, yeah. I mean, people do that now still to the recordings. It's it's. I can't even imagine seeing him live would have been amazing. But now you, you've, you had some interesting interactions with him. He, he's known as a really mellow guy, but... Did he used to go off once in a while when he was drunk. Okay. He wasn't a great drunk. Anyway, he got drunk at a party they threw for him, and I was there, and I was actually sitting next to him when he uh, started complaining that he wasn't long for the world and that uh, that they would, they wanted him to be a clown and he didn't he wanted to move on and. Uh, and I said, Jimmy, you could do whatever you want. And he, now I know he couldn't. He was under contract and with a like gangster manager uh. who said, if you like your little fingers, Jimmy, you'll do exactly as I say. Oh, wow. And, uh, <laughs> jeez. Yeah, that guy died. Jim, Michael Jeffries died. They claim he died over a plane crash over Africa, never found. And he was carrying all this money with him. Oh, man. So I don't know if it, if he just bowed out and snuck away someplace or if he actually died, crashed. I don't know. They're good at doing that kind of stuff. They're they dead. Where's the body? I don't know. Then, right. Or they get another body before DNA. Yeah. And just burn it. And then uh, nobody can tell who it is. Now, one time I heard that... Uh, you and Jimmy had gotten together, and Jimmy actually ended up punching you in the face. Well, that's at that party I told you where I tried to cheer him up. Uh, the party ended, and he put on his coat and turned around and socked me a couple times. And I sat down and thought, uh, he packs, packs a pretty good punch for a scrawny black guy. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty scrawny, you know. Yeah. Why did he, why did he punch you? He claimed I was uh, Jimmy. I was uh, Mickey Mousing him, and I found I didn't know what the hell that meant. Later on, I found out it was a term they used in the army for, you know, BS, uh, or for you know the 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 rules. Okay, all right. The discipline. I don't know. I didn't care. I thought it was a great thing. Oh, you. I mean, Okay. I'm sure people have his autograph and people shook his hand and uh but you know, I got punched by him and uh Keith Richards is very proud of the fact that Chuck Berry punched him, so it's in that <laughs> realm. <laughs> That's and true. Then, then he cried on my hands, which I you know oh, wow. rubbed them in. I didn't not wash them, I washed my hands like a normal person. Right. <laughs> it was a very very powerful experience of his uh, his power and his compassion because he apologized oh, okay. he knew i was Velvet's friend and i usually kept my mouth shut which kept me out of trouble 
Anytime I opened my mouth, it seemed to generate trouble. Kept my mouth shut a lot. <laughs> well, that's that's some of the best way to learn things. Just just observe. Mm-hmm. Now, you also had a really interesting experience with John Lee Hooker. Yeah, John Lee. I was in his dressing room, and he looked at me, and he said, "What do you? Uh, what's your name?" And I said, "Richard." He says, "Richie, what you do?" And I said, uh, "Well, I play guitar." He said, "Are you good?" And then uh, I shook my head like, you know, I don't know, (laughs) so-so. And he said, no, no, you're great. You're going to sit in with the band. Oh, my gosh. The band is all like rolling their eyes and, uh, (laughs) you know, like, oh, there he goes, does it again. Brings up an unknown freak to sit in with the band. (laughs) Well, anyway, it it turned out I ended up doing that. And uh, that's the first time I played in front of a paying audience even though they didn't pay to see me right <laughs> they could have done without me at the time they could, have, could have put symbols between my knees <laughs> should have i could have been a one-man band but it was some boogie and uh, he made me go around three times before oh, he let me go oh my gosh and I, he also and you said he told you the secret to playing electric guitar well said that I should start with one string, learn it up and down, and uh, learn to bend it and to freak out on one string before I then go to two, then three, then four, then five and six. And he said that was the way to really learn. And Jimmy had already, uh, through Velvet, I, we used, he used to take, he was like Jimmy's only guitar student. He used to take lessons with him, and he'd come over to my house and show me what uh, they were working on. Oh, wow. So we did a lot of what, what I call vertical knowledge. That is to say, up and down in pitch on a single string. Okay. Okay. So John Lee was telling me something I was already familiar with, but I did, I couldn't afford to take my all the strings off but one. <laughs> yeah. I literally could not afford another set of strings. We used to break a string and then tie, try to tie the string together. Oh, wow. And put it back on. Oh, my gosh. Whoa. Well, we, we were dead broke. I ate mayonnaise sandwiches for a year. Oh, God. Dumbbell cheese and, you know, we would buy a blimpy and, or a submarine sandwich and split it five ways. Oh, wow. <laughs> Jeez. Now, I also heard a story as a teenager. I'm kind of, I guess we're kind of staying in your teenage years right now. That, we uh, are. Th- I, know, I got a good memory. I don't mind talking about it. Oh, good. Because I heard, uh, I heard this story, and uh, I definitely want to hear if, if this is true, that you actually blew up a Chinese laundry. Well, as I, I'm into science and chemistry was terrific and uh, there was a chemistry lab and I think it was uh, seventh grade and uh, there was the teacher used to send us to buy chemicals at this <laughs> big chemical purchasing place. So oh my we could God. get it basically we could get anything if we went right after school, we could get anything we wanted by saying it was for the teacher. Oh, wow. So we got all this explosive stuff and would blow stuff up. And one day we were trying to mix two chemicals together in the back of uh, my friend Gang Moon Eng's uh, parents' laundry. And uh, the damn thing blew up in our face. <laughs> oh, and my that, God. That, that week it was ticket no laundry. <laughs> it was all the la- laundry burned up. Okay. <laughs> I never, I never saw my friend Gang Moon Eng again. I, they like moved him to another school or something. Oh my god! I wonder why he was. Well, he was not allowed to see me. That's for sure. <laughs> After that. Was was that the most destructive science experiment you've done, or, or the, is there worse? Oh, I don't know. That's just the most funny. It is. <laughs> to blow up a Chinese laundry when you're 11 years old is, you know, pretty. Pretty good. I I'll take it. I've blown up a couple things, but a, right. a business. Everybody everybody blows up something or other. 
Yeah, but not very many can say they they exploded a business. Yeah, Chinese laundry, yeah, a business. Yeah, <laughs> well, we didn't mean. To, it wasn't like we dropped an uh, explosive down a toilet or something to <laughs> blow out the pipes. I mean, it was it wasn't that, and uh, you know, it was uh, accidental. It was your but, curiosity. Yeah, I still have pieces of phosphorus and gunpowder in my arms and oh, geez. oh my gosh. You uh, went out to California before coming back to the East Coast. Yeah, there was nothing going on in New York. And I thought, well, I could either. There are three main music places, Los Angeles, New York and London. So I could have gone either to London or to uh, L.A. And I didn't want to go across the ocean because you can't hitchhike there. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to California. I had enough money to buy a plane ticket and a few dollars, you know. I went to L.A., lived there for about two and a half years. And you, you've you got this penchant for hanging out with and befriending re- some really influential uh, people, apparently. Yeah, and, and those influential people, like myself, tended to get very stoned. Oh, yeah, so I was in in that clique. Yeah, okay, because your your roommate out in L.A. was a, a big music critic for the L.A. Times, right? I think he's still the music critic for the uh, L.A. Times, Richard Cromelin. Right? Yeah, yeah, I was his roommate. Man, I, there's there must you just there's something about you and, and maybe, maybe you're saying you're right. You, you just knew when you were a teenager, you're going to be a successful musician, a successful guitarist. And it just, I it started I happening for you. An impact. I knew I would make an imp- me and perhaps me with others where it was going to make an impact on the history of rock and roll. That was my wish. That was my, uh, certainty. And I didn't know when or how, it was going to happen, but I was, I had, I guess you could call it faith. And it was more than faith, though. I mean, I knew it, that it would happen. I just didn't know how or when. And then, uh, lo, lo and behold, I came, when I came back to New York from L.A., uh, it began to fall into place. All right. I how did you meet up, I guess, with the gentleman who would become your manager, uh, Terry Ork? Uh, at Max's, Can- in the back room of Max's, Kansas City, where all the Warhol people hung out. How did you, now, I, I, sh- I don't, I probably shouldn't even have to ask this because, you, as I said before, you, you just have a way well, of getting into <laughs> it, it. Okay, okay. <laughs> you shouldn't have to ask it, well, don't do it. Yeah, because you've kind of answered it already, I guess. Shoulda, coulda, woulda means didn't. Yeah. Okay. You're right. You're absolutely right. And so, yeah, so you did on. what you did what you do, and you you got back with the uh, the Warhol people and some very influential people in the, the art and music world, and they I guess they took a liking to you. And oh yeah, I'm I'm relatively likable. <laughs> I don't have any uh, you know enemies, so to say. I don't think I do. I have a few freaky people who. You know, you wandered into my orbit, but uh, mostly it's I'm harmless. I'm harmless. I know that much. Well, I had a fist fifth grade. That's the last time I, I was in a fight. Oh, well, that's that's been a while. So that's that's good. It's been a while, you know. <laughs> so how soon after you got back to New York and and met up with Terry, did you, I guess, see Tom Verlaine? Well, Terry and I went to see him at an audition night. He was playing guitar, electric guitar by himself, and he did three songs. And while he was playing the songs, I realized that, because uh, Terry was going to put together a band around me. Right. And I uh, I saw Tom, and I thought, put the two of us together, and you'll have something. Because he was missing what I had, and I, had, and I was missing something, and he kind of had it. It was like a jigsaw puzzle suddenly fit, and uh, the parts conjoined each other. So that's what happened. And how how long had you been in New York when you guys met up? Oh, not a year. Okay. Like six months. Wow. Man, that's pretty quick. 
And then... Yeah. And then I realized, you know, that this was the moment something was going to happen. So this is this is the time you you had you knew you were waiting for. This was the time I had been waiting for. That's correct. And so you guys got uh, Richard Hell on bass, and Billy yeah. and Billy Ficka on drums. Was he he was the the first, he was the drummer, right? I mean, originally, he's, yeah, he's the only drummer that television ever had okay and and uh richard hell had left but you guys richard hell was replaced by fred smith on bass and that was before that was before marquee moon that was before that you guys was before we recorded a record that came out yeah but you We've guys done a bunch of demos but and one or two of them with richard okay um one's notorious because island did it and uh, i Everybody thought it was terrible, but Richard and Island, and uh, so that was his, sort of his swan song. Ah, uh, now you were starting to to uh, appear and, and create a scene actually at CBGBs. You guys, you were really influential in in creating that scene. How did you guys start playing at CBGBs? We uh, rented our own places a couple times, and we realized, well, we can't afford to keep doing that, that we'd only play like every six weeks, every two months, every three months. It was ridiculous oh, wow. if we did that. We needed a place to uh, that we could be the house band, some dinky club somewhere that no one else would want to take away from us so we could build our own audience. Okay. And when uh, we found CBGB's, it was country blues and bluegrass and other music for undernourished gourmandizers. And uh, we managed to get a gig there and uh, brought in some people who did some drinking. So the bar, the owner was uh, Hilly Crystal, and he was happy because we, uh, Terry Ork, our manager, said uh, he would bring a lot of alcoholics to the shows. <laughs> <laughs> which I guess he did because <laughs> I, yeah I remember that and uh, you know wow so Hilly was happy and we were happy so he gave us some more dates and we started playing there regularly and then other bands heard about it we didn't really even know that there were going to be too many other there were a few on the scene but there weren't uh, Talking Heads and uh, Ramones hadn't shown up yet Okay. Uh, there was there was uh, the stilettos, which became part of it became Blondie, and uh, there were a number of bands who didn't sort of make it. Oh, but, I bet. Uh, and then Talking Heads came on the scene really quickly, and so there was a sort of core. Then the Ramones stepped in, and uh, and Blondie, and uh, a bunch of other bands that made you know some success i don't know how big or little and there right. are a tremendous amount of bands suddenly crawling out of the woodwork <laughs> so, most of them were really good and every one of them was extremely different from the others that was one of the things we made uh, you couldn't do covers you had oh. to do original songs oh wow so, yeah, we didn't want any cover bands in there. That okay, oh. that kind of place. So, were you guys? How often during the week did you guys play? And, and I know you guys played multiple sets per night. Three nights a week. Wow. Two nights a week. Four nights a week. Whatever it was. So it did just vary then. Two sets a night. Oh wow. Jeez. So would the opening Jeez. act. So, you know, for instance, Talking Heads opened for us, and then they played after us, and then we played again. So, you know, okay. we would, and we wouldn't kick anybody out between so, shows, so everybody could stay all night. And they did, and slowly it became a, a pretty good scene. So at a bar called CBGB's, which stood for Country Bluegrass and blues, it ended up being mostly 
punk, new wave, post punk kind of uh, of, of a bar. Rock. Yeah, it was crazy rock. Yeah. Music from another planet. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard I've heard that story too. That was that was uh, Amit Ardigan, right? The head of Atlantic at the time. Yeah, <laughs> and he's the guy named Jerry Wexler wanted to sign us and. Uh, we did a private audition for them, and uh, I overheard Ahmed tell Jerry, Jerry, I can't sign this band. This is not eighth music. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought that was a terrific quote. That is great. I wish somebody could have recorded that. I would, I'd, be, I'd be playing it on, the, on your show right now. I'd put in a little drop. There yeah. <laughs> now, there's, and this is part of, of I guess the way I grew up um, mm. I started listening to uh, music really in the 80s and the 90s and uh, mm -hmm. my like we were talking about I you <laughs> <laughs> I <pity> you <laughs> 80s and the 90s I would like you I yeah <laughs> well my mom my mom was a huge Beatles fan and I and, and, and Stones oh, that's nice yeah and, and so Beatles, I grew up listening Stones of course yeah <laughs> So I grew up listening to some some decent stuff at least, but she was never yeah. big into uh, I, guess, I guess the punk stuff. She didn't like the Ramones and all. And by the time <laughs> I she, loved the Ramones, they were fantastic and live, see, really incredible. And and see and that's that's my point is is kind of that I unfortunately because of that I I kind of missed a lot of that because of the, mm. the biases that my mom had kind of given me. So I'm a, I'm a kind of a late comer to bands like the Ramones and television. And, uh, yeah, she she's a big Blondie fan. She liked Blondie. So I got that, but, right. but, um, well, we live, we live, you know, I mean, it, those bands and television, just they're alive. They're still alive. Yeah. Not that they're, you know, necessarily going around and touring, but the records we made are permanent. Well, the record so it doesn't matter how old you are; you can get into them. Yeah, exactly, and and that's one of the the, the great things that I've liked about Marky Moon is that I, it's it's only been the past few years that I've actually opened up and given it a chance, and it's 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 so good. It's actually I've I've seen it online. It's listed as one of the best uh, one, one of the uh, best albums ever recorded. Is you agree Correct. with that? Is that is that what you're feeling about the album too? Or? Sure. Uh, now there's room at the top. There's so many great records, so many perfect, you know, really, uh, like literally perfect records that I'd have a hard time choosing a hundred. But yeah. uh, Marky Moon would certainly fit in there, and that's the end of the story. You know, it just does. And you had uh, Andy Johns. Uh, he produced it, right? Was now had he done a lot? Of, I know he's a he was a big engineer. Had he done a lot of that's production? That's what we before? wanted. Okay. No, and that's what we wanted. We wanted an engineer who was just start just starting out as a producer. Okay, and that was Andy because we wanted to produce it ourselves. Oh, okay, okay. That... The record company wouldn't have, so we thought. We'll get a well-known engineer who's starting to produce. And that way... And we got Andy. Yeah, and that, that way you can kind of direct him, I guess, behind the scenes a little bit more. That makes sense. That's, it's just between you and me. I got to go pretty soon. You got it. You got it. We'll start wrapping up here. So I got a new record coming out. Oh, tell me about on that. November 2nd. Okay. It's called The Countdown. Okay, The Countdown. It's on, on a re record company out of uh, Nashville called Plowboy. Oh, you ever hear of yes. Eddie Arnold? Yes, yes. Well, his uh, grandson has the record company. Oh. And he was called the Tennessee Cow, uh, Tennessee Plowboy. So that, that's why the name Plowboy, which strikes me as a sort of like CBGB's, is a weird, weird <laughs> to have me on a label that's associated with country in Nashville. But, you know. And it fits with it, your history, so though. Yeah, wacky, uh, strange events happening in my life. Like, like moving to Tennessee. You because now you live in Chattanooga, yeah, right? I do. Yeah, where do you live? I live in Virginia, but I I used to live in Alabama, and I I would go up through Chattanooga all the time. I love Chattanooga. Right, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's and it's an up and coming city, 
or if you can call it a city, I mean, they do. Yeah. But, you know, it's just tiny. It's a small city, but it's a great place. And uh, the nature is wonderful around here. Oh, it's it's beautiful. It's much calmer than New York. And my see, my wife's parents are here. Okay. And uh, they're like in their late eighties and nineties. So she wanted to be close to them, and that's why we chose this uh, town over you know any other place we could have lived. Okay, I well, I love it. I mean, the Lookout Mountain, the the aquarium. There's just great food. I I love yep. Chattanooga. It's fantastic. Well, I want to. I know you, you said you've got to run pretty soon, so I want right. to. I want to ask you one more th- question, I guess, and we can go. F- we can go out with this. But how did you begin working with Matthew Sweet? Because I really, really liked your work with Matthew Sweet. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm on like nine or ten of his records. Yeah, he was. There was this band that was doing pretty well with one or two records, but one, their first record did well. It had Michael Stipe on it. It had Matthew. It had a number of people. It had like three or four singers. It was called the Golden Palominos. Yes. And, right. And Matthew was playing bass and singing a couple of songs in that band. Anyway, the, the leader of that band was the drummer, and he called me up one day and he said, uh, my guitar player and one of my singers quit, and I've got two shows this e- uh, uh, this weekend. He said, can you learn 17 songs in three days? Whoa. And I said, no, but <laughs> if you tell me what keys the songs are in, you know, nobody else would, would know that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> so we uh, we went ahead with that plan and Matthew did a couple songs and really liked what I did on them And so we started communicating through postcards. Oh, wow. It was in something I called the postcard club, <laughs> where on a ride or if you were on tour, I would uh, ask them to get a local postcard. And oh. I would send that home or to somebody, you know. Yeah. Anybody. But now with uh, the internet, you don't, postcards have kind of gone away. <laughs> yeah, un- unfortunately. Uh, that's uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the things that technology has ruined. Right. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for your time. Cool. We'll talk Enjoy. to you later. Thank you. See you later. Bye bye.